Hey guys, I'm making this video for some people in my real estate investment group that have asked me to explain how we run our numbers when we buy a rental property. So although we flip and buy rentals, the majority of people that have approached me have asked me, how do you get into your properties without using your own money? And then how do you hold them as rentals and how do you run your numbers on these things? So I thought I would lay out a scenario for you. This is actually the numbers on the most recent rental property that we purchased in our area. Um, we buy houses in Berks County, Pennsylvania cash. We do use a private lender and then we refinance with a local bank. So I'm going to run through that whole scenario with you and how all that works. So first, you need to figure out when you're looking at a property what your ARV is. Right out the gate, this is where most investors fail, completely fail. They either are working with a realtor that doesn't know the market very well, or they're believing some pie in the sky after repair value, which is the value of the property once it's all fixed up and in really good condition. You need to be really conservative with your ARV. So for the ARV for this property, we used 85,000. Did we think it was worth more than that? Yes, we figured it was worth somewhere between 90 and 95, which in the end, it ended up appraising for more than 85. But you always wanna leave fluff in your numbers when you're working on a project, whether it's a flip or it's buy and hold as a rental. Too many people use exact numbers, like a realtor will tell them, or a wholesaler will tell them your ARV is 90,000. So then when they run their numbers, they use an ARV of 90,000. I don't work like that. I like to leave fluff. This is because when you do a number of properties, rehabs, rental properties, whatever the case may be, you know from experience, you're always gonna stumble upon things during the rehab process that you didn't expect, okay? So once you get in there and you start, painting and, they're, and you clean the house out and you're ripping the house apart, something always pops up unexpected. So leave fluff in your numbers and that fluff starts with the ARV. So we knew it was worth more than 85, but we used 85 to run our numbers. That way we were safe. We purchased the property for 50,000. This was a private off-market purchase between us and the seller, nothing on the MLS, no realtor was involved. The number of repairs the property needed, it needed about $8,000 in repair. This was a quick fluff up the bathroom a little bit, add some fresh paint to the property, a little bit of carpet on the second floor, and we were ready to roll. It wasn't a big project at all. The insurance costs for holding this property, I think we held it for about three months and it cost us $1,000. Okay. This almost made me choke on my Cheerios in the morning when my insurance agent told me this. So long story short, we've flipped a lot and we hold a lot of rentals and my insurance cost for that short of a time has never been this high. So this project is actually what prompted me to start looking for a new insurance company, which I actually did. So at the time of making this video, I've dropped one insurance broker and am now working with a new insurance broker because my insurance costs for a flip just kept going up every time we were doing one. So your insurance to hold a vacant property, if it seems rather high, definitely look for another company. I think on average now, for our flips and rentals, we're paying around $100 a month, somewhere in there, for a vacant rental. So you can imagine $1,000 for three months. I was not so happy, okay? So you have to factor in your repairs, your insurance, cost to maintain the lawn. This house had a big side yard. These are numbers people often forget to factor in. You have to remember that you got to mow the lawn and you have to pay utilities while the house is there or your utilities are going to get turned off and you're going to get fined by the borough for not mowing the lawn. So the lawn costs, it costs about $250 to maintain the lawn, $300 in utilities for the time that we were holding the property. Taxes for the time period that we're holding the property were about $1,400. Our closing costs were about 4,580, and this is the cost of our money because we use private money. A lot of people forget to factor in the cost of your money. You're paying interest to someone to use that money to buy the property, so you have to factor that cost in to your numbers, okay? You have to have that in there so that you can pay them back. So between our purchase price and all our costs, we were all into the property, sorry, it's a little messy, for $68,377.50. 
So that's our all-in cost. That's everything that we paid. I'm going to flip to the next page here. Then what we do is when the property is all fixed up, we put a tenant in it and we rent it out and we go to the bank and say, hey, we have this great property. It's all fixed up. I have a tenant in it. I want to refinance it with you. I owe it outright. I paid cash for it. Now I want to get a mortgage. So my bank that I work with will refinance us 80% of the value of the property. You have to know what your bank will refinance prior to buying the property. So don't wait until the point when you're ready to refinance. You need to meet with your local bank. I recommend a local credit union or a small local bank. Meet with them before you even start looking for a project. What percent they're gonna refinance is gonna one, depend on probably the house and the location, to your personal financial statement and what you look like financially. Even if you buy it in an LLC, it still matters to them financially what you personally look like. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So we knew the bank would refinance 80% of 85,000. Now, the bank's gonna do an appraisal, of course. The house appraised for more than 85,000 just like we knew it would. It appraised, I wish I could remember, but we've purchased three houses since um, that we're in process working on, but it appraised, I believe, for somewhere between 90 and 95,000. So it appraised more than the 85, but we're just gonna use the 85 for this example. So it appraised for 80% of 85,000, so they're telling me they're gonna refinance 68,000. They'll give me a loan for 68,000. I'm all into my project for $68,377.50. So what does that mean? That means that this is the amount of cash I am in and this is what they're gonna give me back is $68,000. Now because it appraised for more than this, I know I'm gonna pull all my money back out. But initially, I do my numbers based on worst case scenario. So worst case scenario is it appraises for $85,000 and I have to put out $377.50 to buy a property. Pretty cheap, right? $377.50. I ended up not having to put out anything because it appraised for more than that. So I pulled all my cash back out. So based on my refinance, my payment is going to be $448.77. This is based on 5% a 20-year term, which is the kind of financing that we get when we go to our credit union. You have to talk to your bank beforehand to see what kind of financing you're going to get. So my payment's $448.77, taxes are $233, my insurance is around $60 a month, so my total monthly payment is $741.77. Now, I know the house will rent for like $950 a month, okay? Again, I'm being conservative. When I run my numbers, I figure out before I even buy the property and make an offer how much it'll rent for and if I'm gonna meet what's called the debt service coverage ratio. So my house will rent for $9.50 a month and then I'm gonna have $741.77 in bills. That means that my payment, my taxes, my insurance, you, you gotta pay those things. So despite it renting for $9.50 a month, you don't get to keep all that if you have a loan on it. So it cash flows after I pay my bills, 208.23, okay? So this doesn't include factoring in any cost for vacancy and any cost for maintenance. A lot of times when you run your numbers, you should factor in like around 5% for vacancy, 7% for maintenance, somewhere in there. I know with my bank, their underwriting, when they refinance me, they don't factor in any vacancy and maintenance when they do their underwriting. You need to ask your bank, what should I factor in for vacancy and maintenance? Should I factor in 5% for vacancy? Should I factor in 7% for maintenance, 10% for maintenance? You need to have some fluff in there. Don't think you're gonna buy a property and not have any vacancy and not have any repairs that need to be done. A lot of people make that mistake. So even for my even though my bank doesn't factor it in, I factor it in just so that I know that I'm gonna have enough padding with my cash flow to cover repairs. If you don't, that's where landlords get stuck and then their property, excuse me, go to crap because they don't fix anything. So it cash flows 208.23. 
And I know what you're thinking. That is awesome. That'll pay my cell phone bill. That'll make my car payment. Trust me when I tell you that when you're buying rental properties, you're doing it for a long-term wealth because you're not taking your $200 a month in cash flow and paying your cell phone bill or paying your car bill, or maybe you are, and then when something breaks at the property, you're stuck and you're pulling it out of your pocket. But what we're doing is stashing that all away for repairs. You're basically building a portfolio for long-term wealth. When you factor in vacancy and maintenance, you're not cash flowing this at all. Trust me, a tenant leaves, you go a month without having a tenant in there. You gotta have some reserve to pay for those kind of things. So let's talk about debt service coverage ratio. Ask your banker about this. This is my quick calculation for debt service coverage ratio. Why do I use this calculation? Because this is what my banker told me to do, okay? They wanna make sure that based on your mortgage payment, it's gonna rent for enough and leave a little bit of fluff in there so that you're able to cover the debt on the property, which is the mortgage. So my quick calculation for single family homes that I buy where I don't pay any of the utilities, the tenant pays all the utilities, I take my principal and interest taxes and insurance, my debt that I have to pay every month on the property times 1.25. This is your debt service coverage ratio. Your bank is going to tell you what they use, 1.25, 1.2. My bank actually uses 1.2. I calculate 1.25. Why would I do that? Because I want fluff. I want fluff in all my calculations so that I don't ever end up in a jam because I'm trying to force a deal to work or force the numbers to work. That's the worst thing you could ever do. So I use 1.25 and it come, I take my debt times the 1.25 comes out to 927.21. So what they're telling me is the house has to rent for at least 927.21. Now, when I first started my calculations before I purchased the property, I was banking on the house running for 950 a month, okay? When I got the house all cleaned up and I rented it out, it rents out for $9.95. Again, why did I use $9.50? Padding. I like to leave padding in my numbers. I like there to be some fluff. Don't always add fluff. That's my point. <laughs> always add the fluff in your numbers just to be safe. You don't want to ever force a deal or try and force the numbers to work. You want the fluff in there. So I had fluff in my rent. I use fluff in my debt service coverage ratio. And I use fluff in my ARV. I always know my ARV is gonna be a little bit more than what I'm calculating. I always know my debt service coverage ratio is gonna be a little bit less at 1.2. And I always know my rent's gonna be a little bit more. I always shoot a little low, but know that it's gonna come in a little bit higher. That way you're doing real estate safely and smart. You're not forcing things so that you are a landlord that can take care of your properties and maintain tenants for the long term because you treat them well and you're fixing things. So I hope this helps you guys out. If you have any questions, you can reach me at uh, crawsleyproperties at gmail.com. Um, you can also search us on Facebook, Crosley Properties, or if you're a landlord in Berks County, reach out to us via the Landlord Connection on Facebook. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at House Shopper. Thanks a lot for joining us. Have a great day, guys.